Uh, this work session order, this is Monday, uh, March 14th, uh, 2016. It is 4.30 p.m. And as usual, we're in the Thomas J. Smith Council Chambers. Uh, we're going to uh, roll right downhill. We have a few presentations tonight that we want to get to. Uh, so first, uh, we'll, we'll be giving away two mayor's awards, uh, some wonderful people. Uh, the second thing on the agenda is a public hearing is consideration of a general obligation loan agreement and principal amount not to exceed one million three hundred fifty thousand um, dollars. Yeah, this Travis was here last time to speak about this, um, and you got at that point a timeline for actions to be taken, as well as a packet, which you may not have gotten, Bob, um, on what the bond financing was, uh, the objects that are being covered. Here, the, the not to exceed 1.35 million uh, is a portion of, well, it's for fire ambulance, and then it's a portion of uh, street projects. Um, miscellaneous street upgrade program, which we have listed to also fund a uh, parking lot at 6th and Jefferson. Um, the annual street resurfacing Re rehab program, which uh, streets were outlined and approved uh, this the last meeting or gone over for what we're looking bidding out. Um, and then the Mount Pleasant Street HMA resurfacing, that's a project that's being funded with uh, some funds from the state. Uh, our local match on that is, is uh, being covered with bond funds. So those are the things that were comprised on that 1.35 million. Did you say sixth and what? I'm sorry? Sixth and what? Six and Jefferson was what was listed. It was like 62,000 we set aside for resurfacing on that. Um, and when we okay. did that, we reduced the miscellaneous street program to cover that. Yeah, it should be six in Washington. Six, six in Washington. Washington, I'm sorry, yeah. You were in the neighborhood. I was in the neighborhood. Um, the step that we're doing now, uh, this, the, the resolution you're approving now is a pre-levy that needs to be done by the end of the month. Uh, this authorizes us uh, moving forward with um, having the levy amount to the 250 some thousand and repayment in this next year's budget uh, to be paid for out of property taxes. Um, that, that's why we have to do it at this point. We'll have additional steps in the uh, process of issuing bonds um, during the Next couple of months, in April, we'll be doing uh, do, having a official statement approved in April. Um, we'll do a um, final sale of bonds in May uh, as part of this process as well. So we have a few additional steps as we go through this process. I'm good. Is that enough? It's okay. not for me. Council? It's fine. And you haven't been through this process yet, I don't think, but anytime we go to borrow funds, we have to go through a public hearing process prior to borrowing. Um, there are, there's also a breakdown of what's considered essential corporate purpose versus non-essential. Um, the only, the one item that's would be considered a non-essential, I think, is the ambulance and I'd even have to look that up but when you're under 700,000 on a non-essential you can still do it through the same um, public hearing process you have to let the public know that you're considering borrowing funds to pay for these items and then once you've received comments for and against you have the ability to move forward with authorizing the debt. Right. Makes sense. Uh, anything else on that council? I'm good. Good. Okay, uh, next is a public hearing consideration of plans and specifications for the 2016 Silcoat Streets reconstruction project. Mayor and Council, uh, last year we did Main Drive um, through Craco Park with Silcoat Streets. A um, few years back we had an annual program going again and it, there was the direction from Council that we'd like to return to that and finish up what Sealcoat Streets hadn't been addressed. 
Uh, this is that first year of that implementation. Um, the streets we're looking at completing this year are uh, the streets, the remainder of the streets within the park. Uh, it'd be Potter Drive and Brooks um, and Schneider Drive in Crapo Park, along with um, some of the uh, maintenance drives and the loop connecting Brooks and Potter. Um, <clears throat> additionally, Hillary Avenue from Summer to Central, uh, Linwood Drive from 14th to Central, Central Avenue from Parkway to Linwood, and then Haskell Street uh, just west of the airport. Uh, yep. Um, Haskell last year was not on the five-year street plan. Uh, 14th Street from Parkway up to Park and then a small section of Park from 14th to 12th was. Uh, it doesn't appear that we will have the funding to do all of 14th Street. Uh, Haskell is, we've received a few complaints uh, about the condition of it and the operations manager requested that it be done sooner rather than later. Um, with the funding not being available, uh, apparently for 14th Street, we put Haskell in its place. Uh, 14th will be back on next year uh, when we can do it right. Um, this project's the same project in, as in the past and uh, main drive last year, go through, chew up the old seal coat surface, inject some asphalt emulsion in it, recompact, regrade, and then come back through with a double bituminous seal coat. One thing that is different, uh, previously we've been uh, utilizing crushed limestone. Um, it's my intent to bid the project as either crushed limestone surfacing or um, pea gravel, uh, your river rock stone that used to be used. Uh, there's advantages and disadvantages to each. Obvious disadvantage to river rock is cost. Uh, but my understanding, depending on supply, sometimes that cost is competitive. Uh, P, uh, Crushed limestone's cheaper, but you get dust complaints. So I uh, figured we'd bid it both ways and give the council the option on what they'd like to see done. Uh, right now, our, the construction costs are estimated to be 400000 from the budget, uh, with a little under 53000 for engineering costs. Um, as with the HMA project, with uh, Shipley construction no longer being around, and uh, oil prices varying and the sale of Shipley Ready Mix also. Estimates kind of rough. Um, we're doing the best we can with the information we have and right now it is estimated at 402,000. Um, that's not quite, plans aren't quite complete so it may vary just a little bit to the actual public hearing next week. Uh, I mean as far as the estimate, is that Where's that estimate? I mean, do you feel is that in the mid mid range, or is that think, is that a high estimate? Be I hope the estimate's on the high side, um, and maybe we can add a little more street here and there. Uh, just w as with the HMA, if we can't or if the prices come in over, we'll cut the project down to the budget. Um, but it's just really hard. Shipley's been the primary contractor for seal code around. Um, yeah. I do know that Hickey contracting out of uh, Keokuk is intending to pick up their seal coating equipment. So that, and I know that Sesford has voiced um, that they are likely gonna be picking up seal coating equipment as well. So we will potentially be having competition still. Um, it's just a question of what that equates to. Council, do you guys have any other uh, questions on that? My, my only uh, question that I, <clears throat> that I'm really not not sure how to move forward is on the on the uh, River Rock versus you know the. Uh, One sort. Yeah. I think when bids come in, you'll know which direction you want to go. I mean, there's. Is it going to be that big of a difference? Yeah. Potentially, uh, the, to the tune of thirty to fifty percent difference in uh, the actual cost of the seal coating itself. Mm -hmm. Now the seal coating itself on the project is one of the smaller costs. Um, with Shipley doing uh, main drive last year, off the top of my head I want to say the re asphalt reclamation which is the chewing up the surface and injecting the oil and recompaction, I want to say that was 960 a square yard. Um, 
and the seal coating process itself was around like 280 a square yard. So that 50% increase would put you around $4 a square yard. So it won't be 50% of the entire project, it'd just be that portion. Okay. And it all depends on what the availability of pea gravel is. Is there any other uh, advantages besides the dust? Uh, Class longer. Does it? I. Does it? <laughs> A lot of our streets in Seal Coast streets in town have been there for 20, 30 years. There's a mix and match of seal coat and pea, or pea gravel seal coat and your chip sealed seal coat. Uh, I've seen some of the pea gravel ones that are that are hanging tough. Well, and pea gravel is more durable than um, the limestone aggregate itself. But the primary thing that holds it together is the um, asphalt binder that's laid down with it. So it ages over time. The base getting reclaimed and stabilized beneath it will make a bigger difference in the long run than the actual material of um, pea gravel or seal coat, uh, pea gravel or chip seal. Uh, my personal opinion is pea gravel looks better and then you don't have the dust complaints. But it does have a few negatives to it. It doesn't have quite the same friction um, as the limestone. So when you get snow, it's even less friction for cars, but really, my personal opinion is it comes down to cost. Um, you guys have anything else? <laughs> Thank you, Ryan. Thank you, sir. Okay, uh, next is a public hearing. Consideration of an amendment to ordinance number 3351, Westbrook Meadows Planned Unit Development by adding outlet A to the provisions of the PUD. That's the first reading. Mr. Tisland. This is a continuation of the development that occurred a few years ago on Gear Avenue. Uh, the Westbrook Meadows um, first edition included uh, two duplex uh, structures and two fourplex structures. Uh, at the time, it was planned to continue that to the north to Outlot A, um, but they just didn't have final plans or designs. Um, so this ordinance is coming back with the actual setbacks of the buildings um, based on the placement on the property. Uh, so this would allow continuation of the zero lot line development. Uh, each individual unit would be on its own individual lot, meaning that uh, there would be a lot line between the center of each uh, structure. Um, this uh, component consists of uh, five duplex structures and two fourplex structures with a, a new cul-de-sac entrance into the um, subdivision here. Uh, similar setbacks to the first phase uh, with the rear yard uh, setback of 25 feet with the exceptions of nine and lot nine and 12, <coughs> excuse me, and a zero lot line setback between buildings and a minimum front yard setback of 20 feet. Uh, they will have a stormwater detention area to the east on this property as well as recreation uh, area easement uh, contained within the development as well. Um, this uh, PUD does allow this type of development. Uh, this amendment just specifies the actual setbacks allowable for each uh, individual unit. Any questions on that? Any any issues brought up? Um, no. Nothing. No. Okay. Council. No. Another fine development. Yeah. Okay. By the Pearson Group. Good, good call. Good job, Mike. Uh, next is the motion for final adoption of an ordinance vacating and selling a portion of South 14th Street right of way located adjacent to 1800, 1802. Yes, I did. Thank you, sir. Uh, next, the public hearing consideration of an ordinance rezoning the property located west of Garden Avenue, Lawn Avenue, and Dill Street with R1 single family residential to R2 single family transitional residential zoning district with the PUD, uh, Southern Cross PUD overlay zone, uh, the first reading on this one. This again, uh, vacant property at the dead end of Lark Garden Lawn and Dill has uh, sat vacant for a number of years. Um, they're proposing to develop this uh, with the duplex condos on the site or townhomes uh, would be attached uh, single family dwellings. <clears throat> Similar to the previous development, proposing zero lot line development, so each individual unit would be on its own individual lot so that they could sell 
half of a duplex along with a lot to an individual owner uh, intended to be owner occupied. Um, Garden Lawn and Dill have long been uh, dead end streets, so this would uh, connect up the connect up the streets uh, through. Uh, get this centered here. Through the continuation of uh, Dill uh, Lawn and Garden, with a connection within the development, uh, would be a stub at the north end. Um, but again, they are looking at individual lots. Uh, that's why the lots look smaller uh, they'd have individual units on each individual lot uh, minimum lot size for each side of the unit would be 3,000 square feet uh, with a combined uh, minimum lot size for each structure of 6,000 square feet our zoning code under the R2 standards that they're uh, requesting to rezone to with the PUD overlay is uh, 6,000 square feet for a duplex so that would meet our uh, minimum lot size to have that size of development so it would meet our density requirements under the R2 zoning. Um, go through some of the other requirements. Again, having <clears throat> zero lot line development between the structures, a minimum front yard setback of 20 feet, a reduced rear yard setback of 15 feet, um, maximum lot coverage for the structures within the development of 45 feet, uh, a pedestrian access or pathway shall uh, be designed to connect to the uh, the bike trail or pedestrian path that's to the west of this uh, through the development. So they do have a, a sidewalk connecting from the public street uh, to the pedestrian path uh, to the west of this. A minimum of 15% open space required. Uh, all structures shall be compatible in architectural character. Uh, stormwater management shall be designed um, to meet city code requirements. This would be putting more traffic on Willow on the West Avenue, right? Correct, yep. This wasn't designed as a through street onto Lawrence. Uh, I guess this development was designed to connect up uh, Garden Lawn and uh, Dale Streets. Uh, the limited width of the lot makes it difficult to develop just as single family. Um, to get two rows of single family in there, they do have to have reduced lot sizes. Uh, and based on the developer factoring his costs in, this is what he feels he needs to develop in order to put those streets in and connect them all up, which is something I know many departments would like to see instead of having three dead ends that don't meet our code, having the actual through streets or connections through these streets. So that, that was a big factor within the development. Uh, some of the concerns through the planning commission include the drain, drainage, which is uh, being handled through the planning process. That is part of our subdivision requirements, so they are uh, working through that. They do have a planning commission meeting tomorrow night on the subdivision as well. Uh, other concerns brought up uh, through this process at the planning commission level included the added traffic on uh, the three streets there, uh, the density, uh, this is 30 units total. Uh, which again does meet our R2 standards, but is more dense than what the typical development out there has been. <clears throat> um, and for reference, there are 44 existing lots off Garden Lawn and Dill uh, of existing homes on the prop uh, within that area, in this area, and then they'd be adding 30 more is what they're projecting within this development. So again, this is a request to rezone the property from R1 single family to R2 single family transitional, which is intended to be a transitional district between uh, single family and commercial. It is commercial to the west of this property, uh, the fairway food store and restaurants on Lawrence Drive and the property directly to the west that's undeveloped is commercial as well. So that would be developed as commercial in the future. Um, and then the PUD overlay allows the reduced setbacks and um, within the property and additional lot coverage, but the density is allowed by the R2 standard, so it does meet our density requirements for number of units within this development. Well, I had a phone call this morning from people in the neighborhood. Not <coughs> about yeah. how, how long is, is Garden, Lawn, and Dill? We looked at those this morning, about 700 feet approximately. Is that gonna put them in the requirement of having uh, sprinkler systems on those? No, because they wouldn't be cul-de-sacs or dead ends. There'd be multiple access points to within this development. I see. 
Bless you. So if the they plan. put in the if they put a cul-de-sac at the end of each of these, then there may be some additional requirements. But having them all connect so they have multiple access points is the key there. Is uh, is there going to be additional traffic control required on on uh, Sequoia or uh, Willow? West Avenue or, or uh, uh, Mason Road? At, at this point, there hadn't been any requests or suggestions to do that that may be based on traffic that it could be brought up in the future. But the, the Planning Commission had no issue whatsoever. I mean, I see one abstain, but... Yeah, the Planning Commission met February 17th and voted 5-0 to zero with one abstain to recommend approval um, as stated in your ordinance. Got a lot of people that were present at that meeting. Yeah. That was that my question, Charlie. Were there a lot of neighbors that had issues? Yeah, we had a full council chamber of people that lived in the area that came to express their concerns or talk oh. about ask their questions of the developer. Charlie, can you say who you are just in case somebody doesn't? Charlie Nichols, city planner, 2419 South Main Street. Thank you. <laughs> nice Stop. to meet you, Charlie. Nice to meet you, too. <laughs> but you did have uh, you did have some people that... Uh... Yeah, and the main complaints, Eric went over them, they were drainage. A lot of people have water problems in their yards and in their basements in this area. And water comes off this field is what I understand and it also sits there for a long period of time after it rains. So people are concerned that if you put streets, if you put roofs there, that's more impervious surface that the water is going to flow off of. So we did table the subdivision and the planning commission to give the developer time to do a drainage report showing how they're going to manage all that storm water. So at our next planning commission meeting tomorrow, the developer is going to give a short presentation on how they're planning to manage the storm water to hopefully okay. Uh, alleviate those concerns and show that they can handle that. Uh, the other big issue is traffic. People are concerned that you're going to be adding, you know, 30 new townhouses. The average family in Des Moines County owns two cars, so that could be 60 new cars traveling on those roads. There's one, well, two entrances and exits, so that could cause some issues. Um, the other one, this people seem to be split both ways. Some people wanted parking on one side of the street, and other people absolutely did not want to limit parking on this, any side of the street. So people had different opinions on that. Um, okay. you're, you're talking about parking on Lawn Garden? Yeah, yeah, just limiting it to one side because when people park on both sides, it's about yeah. nine and a half to ten feet yeah. uh, width there. Yeah, that's, well, if you remember, you, you don't remember because you weren't here, but Eric probably remembers when we were talking about Ed Stone Middle School, mm -hmm. it sounds like the same um, arguments that we had then, yep, you remember right. that. Yep. Some of those arguments came to fruition. Which were? The uh, bus traffic on uh, Willow going, uh, yeah. going so north. The main one to me was the water issue that has never been a problem, I don't think. Oh, it's been a problem. I don't it, know if it's increased any, but it's a problem. Well, I know that whole area is, yeah. because if you go there down Mason Road after a big rain, you. It's always oh, got on it. Yeah. Hmm. Okay. okay. Do you guys have any other questions? This, again, this is just the first day of the work session, so we're going to get down to we're going to get down to it. Thank okay. you, Charlie. He, he does have some just preliminary drawings I can show briefly just what what he's looking at doing here, okay. and they'd be duplex condo type development similar to some of the other condos that we have in in Burlington. So different sizes and designs, but those are kind of the four that he's looking at. Okay. Nice looking places. Those could be slab homes or basements? I think it'd be dependent on the purchaser. I think there might be a mix of those. You guys good? Yep. yep. Okay. Now, let me move to the one that I jumped to. How about that? Uh, next is a motion for final adoption of an ordinance vacating and selling a portion of South 14th Street right of way located adjacent to 1800, 1802, and 1804 South 15th Street, Burlington, Iowa. First of all, did we get our question answered about whether we can do this legally or? Yeah, speaking, the response from the attorney was if we were looking to add additional. Uh, 
that would be he would consider that a major change but seeing as how we're reducing the scope of of the action it wouldn't they would not classify it as a major change it's more of a minor change all right Still leaves all the same issues on the table that right. have, that were yeah. already there. Well, one thing I've noticed as I've been out is it's in our neighborhood. You notice the pickup truck at 1408 Harrison has been parking on the grass anyway. So um, I'm guess. glad you said that. Actually. <laughs> I really am. I don't really see why he doesn't want to be included from that perspective, I guess. Well, we're going to get down to it, and uh, uh, hopefully everything works out for everybody, I, I hope. Uh, is there any, anybody else have anything else on that? Uh, there's a, a couple things. Yeah. Did, did you get a visit from anybody? One of the applicants stopped in and said he'd be here Monday. That's the only one that stopped in. None of the neighbors? Mm -hmm. Really? Oh, did you? Yeah. Charlie had a visit. Charlie Nichols, City Mr. Planner. Friedrichson, would you please? Uh... So one of the people who lived adjacent to the street that you're vacating the right-of-way on has a daughter who lives down that street, and her sewer lateral runs to that sewer main that's going through the right-of-way. And if, say, they were to put a driveway from a garage in the back, on to South 14th Street and that driveway was over her sewer lateral. If there was an issue with that sewer lateral, like it would rupture um, and they had to tear up the driveway, she would be responsible for that cost. So if something is built, like pavement is built in the back there, it could increase the chance that one of the people who lives along South 14th Street on the east side of the street would be responsible for tearing up pavement. Um, as it stands right now, if somebody wanted to put a driveway off South 14th, I know, which they wouldn't with the alley, but they could, then they'd still be allowed to do that same thing. Just now I think it might increase the chance that people would put a driveway off that street mm -hmm. and could maybe uh, put a driveway over a sewer lateral that's going to one of these houses on the east side of uh, 14th Street. We could word the vacation in such a way that no pavement would be allowed in that area so that that would eliminate that chance. I don't, I don't think we... No, they can't do anything to that, isn't that correct? Hmm. They can't do any construction or... Can't put structures, structures there. You can't put structures. Pave. Pavement but could, could pave but typically on a drive you would, you have a requirement that it be a hard surface by code. Right. So that would be so counter to what we typically would do to mm -hmm. say that. We couldn't require that they not build or pave over a sewer lateral. That would I, fix the issue, right? I think so. Yeah, I. We're coming down to somebody. We're coming down. Your Brian's got something to say. As far as the sewer lateral issue goes, um, technically, when this is vacated, each property uh, along there that the property would be transferred to, um, there should be an easement for the sanitary laterals from the houses across 14th Street. As a part of that easement, there could be the requirement that no pavement goes over the top of that lap, goes over the top of the easement. Um, just, Charlie called me about this last week. Um, and looking at approximate locations of homes versus where current parking uh, garages are, it's, there's only one, maybe two laterals that would be a concern but it may be something that's worthwhile um, if this is transferred that the language is in there that no uh, pavement is to be placed above the easement. Okay. That makes sense. <clears throat> Can you see that on the, uh, on the picture there on follow 14th Street to the top of the picture, you see that uh, motorhome parked there? Here, right there. That's on city right away. And if you go to, you, you, it, it's not in the picture right now. But if you go behind seventeen twelve, right next to those 
uh, two structures that's in the back of the lot. There's now a driveway there, and it's it's graveled. It's uh, about 24, probably 24, 26 foot wide, probably 40 foot deep. Um, that's a uh, I, I have a hunch that's what we're going to see in the rest of it. There, um, we'll see uh, gravel driveways extended and probably not pavement. It won't be legal, but nothing will be done about it. Um, and it's a, I, I think it's a deterioration of the neighborhood, but that's all right. It's my neighborhood. So. <laughs> and the guy... Uh, at 1800 is buying the entrance to that alley. Um, I don't know if he can limit the access for 1712 or not. 1712 has a drive-through gra uh, garage anyway, so he could he can uh, find a way around that. I guess it was my understanding that they weren't going to be able to do anything at all to that, but. If they can, well, that's kind of, well, that's kind of where it was at that's first. That's what I it was, thought. Uh, that it was going to be pretty much a wrap, but. Um, and what is the advantage of doing this? Remind me again. I guess technically they could put a paved drive. Is that what? Would well, that be that a correct was, statement? That was the intent. Uh, that and possibly a garage. Uh, but they really uh, can't do a structure. But they could can't do, do a structure. Mm -hmm. They could do a paved. Okay, so I thought it was you. They weren't going to be allowed to touch it at all, but okay, they so would I, be able to put a paved drive. Yeah, legally. Oh my. Yeah, I'm gonna have to make a phone call on that. I don't even think I. I didn't even know that we were gonna. I'm gonna. wanted to continue with this. <laughs> so I guess the only way. I would go with this as if, like they were saying, they wouldn't be able to put it over the sewer. But then we'd have to redo the whole thing, correct? Or not? Uh, not us. Ask your well, question. not us. You'd have to amend the conditions to state that. Okay. <clears throat> this is a Solomon moment. <laughs> Amen. Lord. Okay. Um, well, we're gonna we're gonna get some Solomon information here, and we'll and we'll try to be Solomon on Monday. Uh, are, are you guys are you guys good with the information that you have right now? I I'm think sure so. some of you yeah. might have to get some more on your own. I'm good. Okay. I will make a phone call on that and see if I I I was under the impression that this probably would not even be on on the uh, agenda. Okay, uh, let's go ahead and move. Uh, number well, seven. The hearing wouldn't be on the agenda. Yeah, I thought they were. I thought they were going to walk away from it. That's that's what I. That was my right. understanding. <laughs> okay, I, I'm calling you up. Resolution approving agreement with uh, IDOT accepting bridge funding for the Mount Pleasant Street Bridge. Steve. Mayor, City Council, this is just a formality. Earlier, you uh, approved uh, requesting this. Uh, it is in the, uh, the next year's budget. Uh, what you're basically doing is authorizing the mayor to sign and accept this. Uh, we got the letter, I think, of February 29th, and we've got three years to uh, to let the project from that date. So the budget is a little over $5 million, of which we can get up to a $1 million or 80% of the funding up to a certain extent, and we're going to definitely use that $1 million. Current plans are to kind of put together an RFQ and go out and start soliciting engineering services shortly so that we can get the design ready and start working on this project as as soon as the design and, and we get further into it so again just a formality having the mayor approve what you've already done all right do you guys have any We're good thank you sir uh, next is a resolution adopting city of burlington money purchase plan number 10-8682 Okay. Um, included in your packet was the memo kind of explaining why we're doing this. Right. Um, it's just we already have an account set up with ICMA. It's our deferred compensation plan. Um, when Jim was appointed, um, he elected not to participate in IPERS, and we um, 
you approve that you would match the same amount as IPERS, the employer match, into um, an account for him. So um, this came up in reviewing of our plans, um, and it was recommended that we, we separate this out into a, a separate money. Basically, it's a separate 401k plan. They call it the money purchase plan. So that's what this agreement's doing. Um, he would be the only employee eligible, and it would only be the city's contributions going into this plan. So all his separate contributions, salary deferrals, would stay at the deferred comp plan level. So. And the, the point to do this, just the basic point to do this? Legal is, requirements for what 457 is, has a, is, def, is a deferred compensation. Deferred compensation, and that's its specific purpose. And when you're, what gets put into IPER is the city's portion. When it, when, instead of going into IPERS into, the, into this plan is not deferred compensation. It's a different it's just a different designation or accounting. Mm -hmm. It doesn't mean a tr tremendous amount of difference to most people. And if you would go to, from community to community, we've been doing this incorrectly the last couple of years. But if you went across the state, you'd find there are multiple communities that are doing this incorrectly. Some that are doing it right, some that aren't. Mm -hmm. And we'll, all of them will defend the way they're doing <laughs> it. Too. I'm sure, I'm sure. You're not planning on retiring, though. Sometime. <laughs> we say that's why he works every day. <laughs> Are you guys good? Yep. Yeah. Yes. Okay. okay, awesome. Thank you. All right. Uh, the consent is a resolution approving oh, uh, renewal of taxi cab. Number two, resolution approving the Burlington Avenue extension acquisition plan. I get, can we go back to the cab thing for just a minute? You bet. Um, I was waiting for this to, one of these to come up. Uh, Major, do you know... Does Uber have any requirements here in town meeting any of the standards that our cab companies do? Uber? Is that what you said? Huh? What did you say? Uber? Oh, Uber. 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 We're talking yeah. about Uber cabs? Yeah. Uber. yeah. Uh, we have not seen them here. With the, the closest we've seen those is the Quad Cities. They had a few of them up there, but we have not had any applications for those here that I'm aware of or that the mm -hmm. chief has made me aware of unless... You know I think somebody. there was one, might have been somebody in the last couple of weeks, but I'm not exactly sure where that went. And that would be a question to ask of either Kathleen, Katie, or of the chief to see where that went. Yeah, but I know that there was an inquiry it. into it. We don't have anything that, though, that would, on our books, I don't, do we have anything on our books that would, that they would have a requirement for? No, not that we looked at initially. The chief and I looked at that probably there, a few months ago. But Right now at the state level, there's legislation in place that they're considering that would put some some level of requirements but what I've seen on that I think is about proof of insurance liability insurance coverage and that's about the extent of what I've seen I don't know if that gets to what you're trying to find out well, I about. just I just saw one uh, that's been parked down on uh, agency yeah. yeah I think they've been around here the they've last couple of weeks advertising on the on it and, uh, here in Burlington? Yeah. Yeah. I I, that. That's what I think it's just been the last couple of weeks. But you, none, of the, none of the people that were involved in those communications are in this room. So as to what has been asked of or what's been provided. That's, they, they, they've been there for about three months. Um, so I, I, I don't know if they're functioning or not. I just know that the, they've got the name on the side of the, of the SUV and the mm -hmm. phone number. So. Well, they're not registered for Burlington, so I just yeah. looked. That's what I want to find out. I think it's unfair that we have to that we regulate a couple of companies locally and somebody else could come in and take business away from them. Good point. You guys good? Yeah. Okay. Uh, number two is resolution approving the Burlington Avenue extension acquisition plan. This came up, <clears throat> excuse me, came up with the hy uh, gas station car wash development. A portion of the Burlington Avenue uh, that the property at 2500 accesses is uh, on the hy property. And they propose to uh, dedicate that as uh, right away so that it can, uh, I guess, have proper access to the property at 2500 instead of through private property. It goes through right away. So it's a tenth of an acre um, that would be 
dedicate it as city right away. You guys good? Yep. Yeah. Okay. Uh, we have uh, three set date, uh, three public hearings. Uh, the first one is a consideration of an ordinance amending ordinance number 3360 being an ordinance creating the Burlington Crossing uh, PUD plan unit development by making changes to section 5 e signage. Um, anything to be said on that? Not this time. It's okay. going through the planning commission. Right on. Uh, then we also have a, a planned hearing. It's a consideration of a permanent encroachment agreement with Douglas and Dana Atkins for encroachment into city right of way at 914 Maple Street. Do we need to? Uh, it's just a uh, stair access for Kayla's cupboard. Okay. Okay. Discussion items. Renewable Energy Committee update. Mr. Jerry Parks, the piano man. How are you doing, sir? Good. Good. Glad to be here. Um, we have. It's been a little while since we've uh, addressed the council and kind of updated, so we wanted to just uh, touch on a few items. Um, I'll, I'll back up a little bit. I think most most of you may have heard some of this. Um, oops, um, the uh, primary reason we came here today was just to express support for the roundabout project on West Burlington and West Avenue. Uh, we had heard about it and uh, set up a meeting with city engineer Thornburg and went down and talked and visited and uh, very impressed. It seemed like a well thought out project. We feel like uh, there's a couple of, couple of uh, good rationales for this project. Number one, it's going to save some fuels. It's going to save some driver's time. Hopefully it will promote safety. And uh, also we think it's important uh, roundabouts are you know, springing up. There's many countries in the world with lots and lots of roundabouts. They're springing up in more and more states across the United States, so we think it's probably a very good idea that Burlington uh, people learn, have some experience negotiating them and starting to get familiar with them. So we're, we're very happy with the roundabout project. Uh, to back up a little bit, our first, the first big project of this committee was the 2,400-watt uh, solar power project on the Port of Burlington building. This was funded uh, by some rebates from Alliant Energy. Also, uh, Alliant Energy <coughs> has a program called Bright Ideas, and so they, f they help fund uh, innovative ideas, and this was funded under that program. So between the rebates and some of our own money and the Bright Ideas, the project was done uh, under about $4,000, which is you know, way, way less than a typical retail uh, solar project would be of that, of that size, and is still cranking out electricity as we speak. Uh, see some sunlight coming in the window there and uh, has been the only problem we've had uh, we have some uh, TV monitors set up in the Port of Burlington building that uh, show the the output and the total out the current output and the total to total output of the project and we're having a little trouble keeping those up and running and on online so um, another another item that we did we started uh, some energy efficiency upgrades. Alliant Energy had come and surveyed a bunch of our buildings. Uh, we worked with Braden Hill and the Public Works Department, uh, decided to swap out the lights on the 6th Street Bridge, and then we also put in 30 programmable thermostats. That turned out to be a really good project. As, you, as some of you probably remember, the payback uh, period for putting in a programmable thermostat is one year. We spent about $1,800 for these thermostats, and so basically, uh, the, 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 the year that they went in, it should save $1,800 on the city's energy bill. And every subsequent year after that, it would be still saving that $1,800. So that's going to be an $1,800 savings every year from now on out. It, it's such a good deal. We're in the works to uh, put in some more. There are some other locations and city buildings that can use them, and so we're kind of in, in the process of that. Matt Aminel, who is a city rental housing inspector, put on a different hat and helped us work out a plan to lease two Prius Cs. The, the C stands for city. It's the, the Prius designed for city travel. And so rather than have uh, Matt and uh, Craig uh, driving around town chasing weeds in a old police cars, you know, we wanted to get them something more efficient. The Prius C typically gets about 51 miles to the gallon. So that's been working out pretty well. Last summer, we had an entry in the Steamboat Days Parade. We had uh, Paul Gorell 
uh, with his a wind turbine pulled on a trail. <laughs> Which was pretty trail. cool. Yes, it was. That was really cool. And uh, yes, we had uh, Mayor McCampbell driving one of the city Priuses to demonstrate some high efficiency cars. The, uh, the wind turbine was turning as it was going in the parade and producing electricity, which was running a radio and producing music, you know, as we were going down the, the parade route. The, uh, I think the, one of the, the, the most eye-catching things in the parade, we had a, pre, um, a, a Nissan Leaf, and then on the sides of the cars we had placards uh, explaining what kind of mileage they would get in, um, you know, mile per gallon's equivalents. And the Nissan Leaf gets 132 miles per gallon if you convert the electrical, however they do it, you know, to what a typical miles who, who per gallon. Who had that? Was that, uh, uh, that our was friend from Illinois? Jeff Landberg. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of you have been on the council a while. Remember that we begged to have the, the ordinance tweaked just a little bit to allow for people across the river, and that's worked out really great for us. Jeff has been a tremendous asset. Um, the YWCA has a car show every summer, so we had entries in the car show, and you may have seen the picture in the paper. Bob Gertis lent us his 1916 Roche Lang electric car. It's, it was 1916, and it was 100% electric. That's crazy. Back then, and we parked it. Uh, uh, the, Steve Rowland was the person who organized this event, and somehow he was able to get a Tesla <coughs> Tesla Model S down from Davenport. So we had the you know, the 2014 Tesla parked next to the 1916, both all electric. So that was, that was pretty exciting for people to see. The, um, the other thing we did last summer at the farmer's market, we had a solar trailer. This is owned by iRenew, which is a, a renewable energy group um, organized out, uh, out of Iowa City. And it's a large walk-in trailer. Some of you may have been through it. Uh, it educates people about the value of solar energy and how, how uh, solar electricity is generated. It has panels on top of the trailer, and it generates electricity while people are going through. And then we use the electricity generated to pop popcorn and give it away free. And a number of people said they, they thought they could detect the difference in the taste. Oh, <laughs> you, I knew that solar was coming. <laughs> solar electricity popcorn. Whoa. I knew that one was coming. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Um, on, if you believe that, we have a <laughs> <laughs> our, our big news, we, do, we really do have some kind of interesting news. Uh, we decided to apply for another Bright Ideas grant with Lion Energy and put in a proposal to get some electric car chargers. And yes. uh, we, we've been awarded a $25,000 grant to put in five car charging stations. Wow. It would be three in Burlington and two just outside the city limits. So the plan at the moment, it's still kind of the details are, you know, being finalized, but the plan at the moment is to put one car charging station uh, at the city parking ramp at Maine and, Maine and Washington, right next to the Circle K, probably on the upper deck, and two charging stations at the High Beyond Agency. And as you know, I know you've been working the last couple of months on their, their request to take over some more land and, uh, that's where the two charging stations will be. They're going to be putting their gas stations somewhere close to where the old Flint Hill School is. And then we're going to put two other charging stations at SCC. They do, SCC has a, a car, an electric, you know, they have an auto program. And as part of their auto program, they, they teach kids how to, you know, work on electric cars and how to charge them and things like that. So we will have two. And uh, the SEC one, uh, hopefully we'll be getting one in, one started fairly soon. The other one may have to wait until the, you know, further on down in their construction process. But we're, we're very excited about that. Jeff Leinberger, again, was probably the, the lead person on that project. So have some interesting things going on. We want to thank the council for their, for their support. You know, we're trying to use uh, the money that you provide us each year. Uh, very responsibly and do some good for the city and for the community as well. And I'd be happy to answer any questions or take any suggestions anybody has on future projects. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chair. Good job. Good job. That's awesome. Could I just interject here? The, the appointment is actually going to be to the Renewable Energy Commission on your agenda, and that's um, Frank Statler is asking to be a part of the Renewable Energy Commission. So that's skipping down to the appointment. Okay, that's thank you. Headed for, since nope. he was up talking about it. Good deal. Okay, uh, next we have Apollo School Proposals. 
Bruce One of the things that we've had some conversations on in, internally, there have been a couple of different, uh, we received two requests initially, one first from Peter. Uh, we, <laughs> you're gonna have to say that because I'm not gonna get it right. Um, we also had gotten an email, all the council had from uh, a, a lady who's looking to, with a proposal for an art school, I think, yeah. something like that. Um, and as we went through that process, we thought that the best thing to do was to have any entity that had, that had expressed an interest start um, get presentations made here so you can kind of hear where the different groups are coming from. With that in mind, uh, Eric reached out to both her, the the lady who's I th she's I can't remember her name Stephanie Stephanie yeah. she's scheduled to come in the next uh, council meeting next work session mm -hmm. at the end of the month uh, but Peter was uh, available to come this time and um, I met with you earlier today and Richard <laughs> Silva um, is here as well uh, he had expressed an interest too for to have an alternative proposal so. Tonight we do have two proposals on board um, to put before you. I, in regards to the process, I guess part of what our intent was to get the, the three proposals that we knew about out to you so you can hear them. Um, I don't anticipate having another proposal come forward, but if one were to, we would yeah. certainly want to have that come to you too. If there was out after you get through those proposals, if you have a spot, if you have an interest in seeing us pursue one of them farther, uh, the goal would be that uh, well, this would be done through the TIF TIF process for community development to go through a public hearing for the for consideration of a given proposal, uh, give the full 30-day process for for input to be done for alternative proposals to be presented go through the public hearing to consider the formal one that you're looking to go with um, as well as and if there were some additional proposals to to think of it about at that time um, and then to, if you wanted to pursue that proposal that you had on board to, to move forward with it um, but that's kind of a longer framework of where we'd have to go over the course of a few months if we're looking to do something here uh, tonight, um, I guess what we'd look to do is if um, Peter with Miller Valentine, I'm again still not going to go with your. No problem. <laughs> you can introduce yourself. Oh. <laughs> um, make the initial proposal and yeah. we'll allow Richard to present where you're sure. at. Too. Sure. Well, thank you so much for your time. Um, as mentioned, my name is Pete Schwigerot. I don't know why he had so much trouble with that, but <laughs> he did, so I'll help him out a little bit. With Miller Valentine Group, we're located at 9349 Waterstone Boulevard in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, thanks for having me out today. Oh, thank you. Is that up now, or you're going to share? Wonderful. Um, just real quick before we go into our proposal here tonight, um, uh, I did just want to give you a quick introduction to Miller Valentine, because while I hope you like my, the vision that we, we have to present, I think one of the things that's most important uh, for you as a city and as we would bring this project forward is our experience and our capacity and our ability to perform on this project. Miller Valentine as a company has been in existence for now about 55 years. We're a full service developer. We really do anything and everything under the rainbow, commercial, office, retail. In our home markets, we're really known as a high-end professional office space builder. We develop a lot of high-end medical office space. We've built hospitals. Uh, we've built um, institutional buildings on um, campuses, uh, University of Cincinnati, University of Dayton, uh, several other colleges. Um, uh, we've done a lot of industrial work. And about 25 years ago, in an effort to diversify, we got into housing. Um, we're also fully integrated, so we're uh, the developer, we're an owner, we're a contractor, and we're a property manager. So uh, who you see at the beginning of the development is the same folks you're going to see at the end of the development. As I get into our housing portfolio, you're going to realize we will be here for the long haul. We do not sell our residential assets, um, and in fact, we, we still own our very first uh, housing developments we ever built. Is there a certain way I got to, there we go. I passed it. 
you still own from from 50 years ago? Well, uh, our housing division has only been in existence for 25 years. So from 25 years ago? Yes, our uh, very first development was in Lawrenceburg, Indiana, um, a 8,000 person town along the Ohio River. Um, we built a 62-unit uh, development there um, using the same some of the same funding we're talking about using here, and we still own it, still manage it. In fact, um, just four years ago, we reinvested $11 million into the facility to improve it. 20, 25 years uh, of age, properties need some attention, and Miller Valentine is a long-term owner, and really is a relationship builder and a community development builder. We we uh, we like to reinvest in our properties and keep them in the best shape. And so certainly you go look at our product that's 25 years old, you're going to notice it's a different design, it's from a different era. But what we're proud about is you're going to see the same quality you see there as you'd see in a property that might be only five years old. Sure. Um, but as you can see, over 25 years, we've developed over 13,000 units. Um, it's a mix of affordable housing, workforce housing, senior housing, market rate housing, and for sale condos, homes, really anything and everything under the rainbow we have done. As we've grown, we've expanded into 18 states. One of those is Iowa. Uh, we came into Iowa about six, seven years ago. Um, since then, we've developed uh, eight developments in, in Iowa, and I'll go over those in a moment. Um, with the experience and the amount of development we do on an annual basis, we're considered around the, uh, I think it, this was 2011, we were considered the 11th largest. From year to year, we end up anywhere from uh, the 10th to 20th largest multi-family developer in the country. We're normally doing about 10 to 15 projects a year in a mix of variety of states, and including a mix of product types as well. Um, so, you know, with that, um, we have a tremendous amount of experience and capacity. Um, because this is an existing building, some of these projects I'm going to show you really do lend themselves to adaptive reuse. The Alexandria was a historic hotel in inner city Cincinnati, uh, not quite downtown, but right outside downtown. When we acquired this building in, I think it was 2000, it had been abandoned for 15 years uh, and then had recently under, gone through a fire. The whole entire roof was burned out of this building. It was already on the, historic, or on the National Register of Historic Places. We acquired the building, secured financing using historic credits, housing credits, and some other sources of funds to rehab 120 units of housing. Um, it is senior in nature, um, but since has been operating um, very well and uh, is a complete turnaround from what, from what you would have seen 15 years ago. Um, Park Place at Lytle was actually downtown. This was the largest downtown Cincinnati condo project in, in their history. Um, it was actually an old factory converted using historic credits and other layers of financing. And these are actually for sale condos, uh, range in price from around 450 to 1.2 million. Uh, we, what? <laughs> wow. Uh, right, out, right outside P&G's world headquarters. We need, so we, need a couple, we need a couple of those here in Burlington. <laughs> Mayor, would you be at the lower end or the higher end? <laughs> what do you think? <laughs> uh, yeah. First, we've got to be able to get in the door, but you know, we can all dream, I guess. Uh, but as you can imagine, they're, they're, they're catering to, um, uh, this is literally right outside the doorsteps of Procter & Gamble's world headquarters, Western and Southern's world headquarters. Yeah. Um, so it is the right place in, in, for, that, for that type of product. And since then, you know, really, uh, Downtown Cincinnati has been gangbuster, so we're excited about that in, in our backyard. Grant Place in Dayton, now this is, I like these pictures because it really lets you see the, be, the before and after. What well, can be a boarded, dilapidated building that is a blight and a nuisance to all communities. We all have them. <laughs> no, no community is uh, without these types of buildings. Uh, but you can see the end result. This was converted um, uh, using housing credits and historic credits uh, to build um, 70 units of housing. I think the, the key point here is how complicated these adaptive projects are. Is mm -hmm. It's not easy. You, you're not just going and getting one layer of financing. You're getting another and another, and then before you're done, you realize you need another and another. So you really need to know your sources, know how to get these done, where you can go find the gap fillers. Um, but ultimately, you know, nine layers of financing later, you've got a, a project that can be built. And um, we'll kind of go through some of those layers of financing. We're going to need to do something here in Burlington here shortly as well. Uh, Ross at Roberts, uh, this is my most recent uh, that I can show you in its complete form. This, this was a vacant hotel, sat uh, abandoned for eight years. 2000, uh, the crisis really took it under. It was about to convert into uh, a high-end condos by another developer. They were defaulted on. We bought it from a bank. 
um, after the fact. Um, it sat vacant for eight years. We then finally um, secured housing credits and historic credits and used some city financing, AHP funds, county money, um, really anything and everything, facade grant funds. It was, a, again, you can see 11 sources. I think this is the record for the amount of different sources used in one project. Uh, but this was neat because it actually included a first floor retail. We used uh, the old restaurant, is actually now a new restaurant. We uh, worked with the city, created a business incubator, and they actually now lease, all, lease a out. business incubator. Business incubator. Uh, basically, it's an office space where instead of creating your 1,500 square foot office, you just rent an office within there, and you have a shared conference room. Okay. Some, some folks were actually just renting a cube. Um, and you just go do your work. It gives you a chance to interact, engage. How, how, big, is the, how big is that starting, starting to be in the bigger cities? Uh, You're seeing is it? Is really? I mean, is that moving like they said it was going it to? Does, it is. It's normally driven mostly by either community development corporations or local not-for-profits or sometimes um, in uh, the case of the city. Um, in this case, uh, Muncie had created a redevelopment commission. Um, they, they then acquired. We condoed this building. We deeded the first floor retail to them. And they're actually operating this as a business incubator to encourage and facilitate new business. So it does take partners. It takes a local sure. partners. But it's certainly something that can be considered in all projects. Uh, and I, I have a feeling to some extent this may have some mixed use components. And I'll try and get into that a little bit as well. But I think really this kind of shows how you can take a building, repurpose it, find multiple uses to put inside it to make it work together and get bring back the vitality the uh, energy that you need to a building in a neighborhood. Um, this is actually downtown since this was built. Um, Marriott, um, who didn't want to build downtown because they were afraid this would become another hotel, then now is building a $16 million facility across the street. So it shows how activity can spawn activity and how one project in a neighborhood can and really bring back a neighborhood or at least start the turn. Sure. And we do want, if we were to do this building, we really do need the city to be thinking larger about the neighborhood and how we can use this as a catalyst to improve the neighborhood because the last thing you want to do is invest 15 million dollars in a somewhat challenged neighborhood if nothing else is going to occur in that neighborhood oops i not so good with my clicker here i apologize um the reason i showed this next project is it shows how projects can yeah, i'm very bad with the clicker i take that back how projects can use a mix of products so in, in, in Huntington, Indiana, we used a mix of an existing building. There we go. The building on the bottom there is our Sunday Visitor Building. They create those, uh, the missalettes for all the Catholic churches across the country. Um, one of the biggest publishers in the country, but they only do it for the churches. Um, but that was their original work. I'm not touching anything, I promise. <laughs> <laughs> that was their original world headquarters. It was a little bit smaller of a building. So we couldn't fit everything, you know, that you need some economy of scale to make these projects work. And so we were struggling to fit, we got about 30 units in the building, we needed to do a 50 unit project, so we went and acquired some vacant property across the street. And we made a hybrid project where we did a adaptive reuse, new construction, combined together. And that really was nice because it not only improved what was a blighted property in town, but then it also showed some new activity and some new buildings, which they found was very important for their downtown to show that there's something new going on as well. Um, but again, a uh, great project. We just will be having a grand opening for this one two weeks from now. It's, it's already completely full. Uh, now to Iowa, as I mentioned, I talked about some of this. We came into Iowa about it six, eight years ago. Um, and we've done eight total developments in Iowa. We were in uh, two in Altoona, South, uh, Des Moines, Newton. We just had a grand opening last week. I was um, excited to be out there for a grand opening in Newton, Iowa. Last year, we were funded in Keokuk, Centerville, and Des Moines. Uh, we received more tax credits allocation than anybody else in the state. We took about a third of the pool. I thought you did some stuff in Cedar Rapids. We applied in Cedar Rapids a few years ago. We have not completed a project in Cedar Rapids yet. Um, you might be thinking of Richard has something in Cedar Rapids. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, let, this year, and I, I'm going to step back to, th we were funded for two projects. Um, but at the same time, I want to congratulate you as a city because you did just receive a tax credit award last year or last week, so congratulations on that. It is a preservation of existing affordable housing, so unfortunately it's not going to create any new housing opportunities for your community, but it will improve and hopefully create a nice high quality option of what you are, you know, improve what you already have. Eric, uh, just interject, Eric, where was that at? 
uh, <coughs> is Millennia Housing with the Maple Hills Apartments. Uh, so wasn't aware that they had even applied. So it's They've been working on trying to get that funding secured for at least, this is a third cycle that I guess yeah, I'm aware of. Yeah, at least three, three plus years, so. so. Maple Hills. Yeah, and for what it's worth, I think it was the lowest scoring project in the state that was funded, which is great to get it through. I mean, it's, it sounds like something that couldn't score well, but it slipped through. Unfortunately for us, and this is kind of, and Richard and I are technically here separately, but ironically enough, we have done some development or attempted to do some development together, one of which was the Apollo School that was not funded, unfortunately. So we're sorry to say Salter, that. Salter School. I'm Salter sorry, school. Apollo School. Let's hope we get an opportunity at the Apollo School. Um, so the Salter School, unfortunately, did not get funded. We are still very perplexed by this. In our world, the score was technically high enough to be funded. In fact, Miller Valentine, as I said, received two awards. Uh, and again, I think is meant more than anybody else in the state. The Salter School scored higher than one of our other projects that was funded. So we're having a little bit of a debate with the state at this point as to why Salter wasn't funded and this other one was. We haven't got quite to the answer yet for what it's worth. This has already been approved by their board. There's nothing we can do to change what they've funded. But I'm hoping by the time we would go explain to them and understand well, what, what happened, who knows, maybe there will be a way that we can make an argument for, for something for the future. I don't Use know. Use your leverage, my friend. <laughs> Try every angle I can. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> um, so again, I want, to I want to thank Richard and the city for all the support you gave us in the Salter School effort. Uh, I'm perplexed a little bit, still trying to understand why. Um, when we find out more, we will let you know. Uh, I've expressed to Richard that if that project were to attempt to go forward again, we would certainly be happy to facilitate that. Um, uh, if it's not, we are certainly all about the Apollo School. And really, the Apollo School can compete better than the Salter School can. School, uh, yeah. school can. Um, we've really been looking at this building for over two years now. Um, uh, my meetings go back with various council persons, staff, etc., cetera, um, and the, you know, trying to find the right site and get the timing right. And unfortunately, we were not able to do that for this year with the Apollo. Uh, hence, I joined and assisted, attempted to assist Richard in his efforts with Salter. Um, Miller Valentine, uh, the, in the scoring system, if you have certain levels of experience in tax credits, you score better. So we were able to bring some scoring to the application that it otherwise couldn't have had because of the amount of business and work we've done in the tax credit world. Unfortunately, that still wasn't enough. We'll, we'll certainly be working with the state agency to figure out what went wrong and why these weird things have occurred. And as soon as we know, we will convey that to Jim and Eric so that they can convey it on to you. I know that's not what it's about, but I did want to thank everyone for their time and the support in that. Um, you know, we probably had $30,000 invested into that application and hundreds of man hours, and I know Richard had uh, plenty of man hours in there as well. We wouldn't have made that effort if we didn't think we could bring it forward. And unfortunately, I think they received 40-something applications, had enough money to fund 11, and that's the way this tax credit program is. It's 25% hit ratio. We feel pretty good to have gotten to, to be honest, but um, unfortunately, one of those wasn't here in Burlington. So again, we're here to try and try again. We're committed for the long term. Um, so, you know, one of the things I want to point out is, is we are community driven. The uh, reason we've been doing business for 55 years is we listen, we are long term member of communities, we want to be able to come back and do more business, bring our commercial efforts and our other efforts to a community. So whatever we would do in this project would include your input and it would be your vision that hopefully we're just a facilitator of. We would in involve a process that would include public meetings and hearings to get community and neighborhood input. The project would be bid locally. We are the would be the general contractor. We do not self-perform any work. So it would be bid locally. It would be your local subcontractors that would bid it. That relates to Section 3, which basically is a mandate that says that we're going to assist and make sure we use local labor in our projects. Um, also, there will be hires with this. So we would have local hires that would occur to uh, manage the property as well. We'll also be using Iowa-based uh, architects, engineers, and, and consultants otherwise. Uh, we want to make sure this has an impact uh, on the city of Burlington and the state of Iowa um, as well and benefits your community. Um, we really have two options. Option one is our key and primary option. 
uh, but we, we, we are committed to the project in, in either event, and for what it's worth, as we, if whoever you select um, with, for this building, they're going to have a ton of due diligence to do. So I just want to preface that we're going to do our very best, and our goal is to do our very best to preserve this building and to return it to its original beauty. That being said, if you select us and we start those processes, we could get a long way down the pathway and find all sorts of problems that you just couldn't know until you dug in deep enough. So if that were to occur, that doesn't mean we go, oh, sorry, we're out of here. That means we step back, we look at it from a, develop, a, a demolition rebuild perspective. The site still equally is uh, interesting to us and we can still make something work new construction. But we really think this has the best opportunity for success as an adaptive project um, and probably has hopefully the, the most benefit to the community who I would imagine has probably not happy with seeing the building in its existing condition but probably can yeah. envision the building in a much better past. So um, hopefully we can bring that back to life. Um, the scope, and this is a little fuzzy, so I want you to be careful with this, and I'll try and preface, is I'm showing 90 units, and I'm showing workforce housing. 90 units would actually equate to two phases of housing. Um, the building's kind of an awkward size. You can really only do about 45 to 50 of these units at a time using the housing credit program. The building probably can hold about, depending on what size units we do, somewhere between 60, 65 units. So you may not be able to use the whole building with one phase or else you're giving up some extra space or dead space and that's just not very effective for projects. So we're looking at a project that would be two phases. One would use, the first phase would be about the building and rehabbing the building. We may have some additional space in that building that doesn't get all the way finished. Um, and that would be part of phase two. And then phase two in theory under this premise would be the remainder of the building Plus, we would then be looking to do some scattered site, single family homes around the building on vacant lots in the area. How do you that, define workforce? Uh, workforce um, is really targeting your working class citizen. So whether it be your firefighter, your police officer, your educator, your service industry, your street crews. So are there income? Income based. There are some income restrictions. It will have a variety though. So it'll have a market rate component, and a tax credit component or income component that would target 60%. Similar to the Salter or similar to what was just funded, the tax credit program requires their dollars be used on 60% AMI, 60% adjusted median income for the county. Um, and with that though, there are incentives to also including market rate units. So we will have market rate units. It would probably be somewhere between 10 and 15% of the units. Um, some neat things about tax credit, so is a one-time test. So say you're a starting teacher and you're making $35,000 a year and you got a couple kids, you might meet the income criteria because you're just starting your career. You, you live in this unit and we give you a great rent rate. And, uh, and then as you grow your career, maybe five years later, you're making 55, 60,000, which is above the bar. You don't get kicked out. You, once you're in, you're in. You would only Do have just change, They would adjust your... Uh... No, wouldn't even adjust your rent. It would, it's just a one-time test. So once you're in, you're in. If you leave and then try and come back when you have made more money. That's you, a difference. Yeah. Yes. Oh. But once you're in, you're in. So it's a, it's a great way to get young families in, allow them an affordable rent, allow them to then save some money so that they can then enter <coughs> ownership earlier. If we got to the phase two that included the single family homes, the neat component there is their 15 year lease purchase. So you actually end up in an ownership conversion at the end of the period. Um, so that would, in theory, be part of the phase two, though, more than phase one. Phase one's all about the school. Um, so depending on if we get one or two phases, this could range anywhere from 50 units to 90 units. We're hoping that we can think bigger about transforming the neighborhood, and if we're going to do so, I think we've got to be thinking about more than just one phase. Um, we will be designing to, to historic standards. We would apply and get the building on the register. Um, and utilize the federal program, uh, which would assure that it's preserved in its proper conditions. We'll also be using brownfield and grayfield credits uh, through other sources. Um, it would be built to green building uh, standards. In Iowa, they call it the Green Streets Program. So it would be all green building design, energy, highly energy efficient. Um, obviously, the final unit counts to adjust, and um, we'll use the LIHTC program to make sure we can maximize what we could do in any given phase. 
uh, the product would be a mix of ones, twos, threes, and fours. The ones, twos, and threes would be all of the Apollo, um, the Apollo School building. Uh, and then the threes and fours would be part, more probably likely part of that phase two where we would start to s spill out into the neighborhood and build four bedroom homes and, and actually um, uh, do some of those single family units. There'll be very unique loft style uh, apartments that we would build in those spaces. There are high ceilings, a lot of exposed, you know, a lot of what you see in the urban uh, revitalization type projects really expose and show that structure, those original structures. Um, it'd be a 100% accessible development and it would have a full spectrum of amenities in the units, your AC, your dishwashers, your disposals, anything and everything you would expect in your home, I bet we can find in here. Uh, even the bedrooms, we're doing walk-in closets and things of that nature. Uh, it's, they are true homes um, when they're done. Community amenities, we'll have on-site management, we'll have a community room, we'll have a business center, we'll have a small theater, we'll have a fitness center, supportive services, so these are just services that help residents access to childcare, access to transportation for those who might need it, uh, et cetera. Um, we are planning to preserve the auditorium. It seems like a very, I haven't been in there yet, but it seems like a pretty unique space. Um, as of now, it's the intent, if we were to use the credits, they're likely gonna make us preserve it. And so. Figuring out what to do with it's the bigger challenge, and I'll go into that here in a second. Uh, we would be providing parking per unit, um, outdoor areas and spaces, playgrounds, et cetera. Uh, we've actually been doing indoor playgrounds in a lot of these communities, like almost like your McDonald's setup, so that if, if it's winter time, the kids still got somewhere to go and be active. Uh, what we've done, we're doing in downtown Dayton, we're using the historic arcade and we're turning it into an art, art space loss, where we really um, have integrated an arts district that they're creating in downtown Dayton with, with housing and actually creating artist lofts um, and so forth. And, and while we're not, we haven't really investigated deeply how deep the arts community is in Burlington, we have had kicked around the idea that this might be an art space community, meaning we'd actually create some of these units as live work units where an artist would have space to do their work in their unit or potentially provide some artist space studios as part of the community amenities so that we can encourage local trades, creative thought, creative thinking, and really integrate that into the project. That is just us touching the surface. We obviously got to do a lot with to understand what the needs are in the community for that. Ironically enough, we come in here and somebody's talking about an art school. So there are some spaces in this building that I can't use, and if we find the right partner, and we are looking for local partners that might be able to help us use some of these spaces. So keep that in mind as you talk to some of the other folks interested, maybe there's ways we can work together uh, on this building. <clears throat> I've done some sketching. This, these are some original sketches here. Um, these units are set up mostly as ones and twos, but we're basically getting anywhere from 20 to 25 units per floor. All units are gonna have um, uh, Strong light, one of the good things about this building, it's got a lot of interior um, uh, light wells and stuff that allow some of the internal <coughs> building to function. Uh, but again, we're trying to preserve the original auditorium space. We may try and preserve one of the gymnasium spaces for amenities, um, but this would be the second floor. Uh, there's the first floor and then the basement floor. Um, again, we were, this was more space study to determine how many units. This shows about 70 units in the building. Um, so again, if we do a phase, we're either gonna have to find a partner to use the rest or come back and do future phases. Um, I'm showing you these homes. These are some of the scattered site homes we built. These are four bed, two bath. They're throwback, so they're intended to fit into these old neighborhoods. They're old bungalows and cottages. They really take a lot of that historic and old school look from the 20s and 30s which really somewhat dates the neighborhood and I think they would fit real well into that architecture. The four bed, two bath, two car detached garage, it says 1350, these are 1500 square foot homes though, they are lease purchase. Um, but they, I think they would fit real well into the neighborhood if we could get to that second phase. So I just wanted to show you what we thought might be there. This is looking at any given phase. So if we're looking at a, a single first phase and it's probably more like 50 units, but 45, you're, most of your sources are coming from LIHTC. You got historic credits, you got workforce credits, Brownfield, Grayfield credits. We would be putting some of our own money in this development, and then we'd probably uh, take on some level of permanent debt. Um, this also does include, and I want you to be aware, we could not do this without local resources. 
Um, just as with the Salter application, the state requires to get all the scoring 7% of total development costs. You probably remember that from last year. That would be similar here. The simplest way to look at it from my perspective, though, is if we could just get a commitment for a 15-year TIF, that is going to get us our 7%. It might be slightly more, but this is a pretty complicated project. To, to preserve this building, um, we're going to be banging our heads against the wall. We're going to need every, every resource we can get. So we think that's the amount that makes the most sense. We'll also be applying for uh, federal home loan bank funds and other funds as well to, to try and fill those gaps. And this is very conceptual. So try not to lock into, into the numbers too detailed, but um, it's what we think we can do. Our goal would be this. Just as last year, you apply for tax credits December. December of 16 would be the next opportunity to apply for tax credits. That's a while away. You don't need to make up your mind today. But the problem is, is that in order to make for a successful application next December, we're going to have to go line up some other sources so that by the time we got to the tax credit process, we could say we've already got our historic designation, we've already got our brownfield credits, we've already got our workforce credits, and now all we got to do is have IFA fund the tax credits and we're done. So in the perfect world, and you, you get to determine the schedule, but in the perfect world, you would select, identify and select your ideal partner um, March, April, and try and making a decision on that, who that might be maybe by the end of April, so that May, June, July, that person, if they were to do what I'm planning to do, we could go secure the workforce credits, put the building on the register, get all of those other ducks in a row so that by the time we got to December, we're sitting in the right place. Um, so certainly happy to answer any questions you might have about us or our proposal. I hope that gives you a, a little bit of the detail and certainly I can bring you more detail as we move on, uh, move forward with the project as well. I'm excited to have you looking at the building and uh, um, I really would like to see, uh, I really would like to see something done with that. So uh, I'm hoping that uh, that we can get something worked out. I spent 14 years of my teaching career in that building. And it makes me sad to look at it. So I wish you well. I hope Thank you get you. it done. Yeah, it you seems like you have. You or whomever. Huh? Go ahead. Oh. Done. <laughs> it seems like you have a lot of great ideas, different, a variety of things that you can do or want to do. So <clears throat> thank you for the presentation. Appreciate your time. This is not within our extended 10-year 10, 10 tax abatement schedule area. Um, as he mentions, the TIF, uh, given the structure of where our tax abatements are versus uh, where this property sits, a TIF, if you were to look at being a participant somewhere along there, a TIF rebate would be uh, probably a better avenue if you're willing to consider ex that type of a, an abatement structure. Um, Part of any discussion with e either of these two developers or anyone else, if, it, if something like this comes up, um, if you're doing it for for trying to get this kind of credit, you also have the the value of the land and the property itself that gets to be considered as part of whatever that match is on there. So that there's some other discussions that can be had about how that structure works. Um, with the TIF rebate and having to go through that process. Um, one of the things to think about with the, the TIF, it allows you to take into consideration on a transfer of property. You don't have to get necessarily the best dollar value. It's what you see as the best economic or community development for the area. Um, and I don't quite understand how all that works, but within TIF, uh, you don't have to get the best dollar for dollar value if your project is getting other things that you're looking to get out of, for the development of our community. Very interesting. He's good. Any other questions with him since he's already sat down? <laughs> All right, Richard. Well, I, I, I think you should do his deal, actually. About <laughs> <laughs> this. It's a great deal. Uh, no, very, very honestly, um, Miller Valentine's is a spectacular company. They they have more experience than more experience than anybody else who's developing in Iowa for sure. Um, 
I would, I would uh, look at this development probably with a company called TWG D Development, and I did not bring the whole resume of TWG because I didn't, I really didn't think that that was the purpose of this. But we could have brought all the pretty p p pictures and so forth and done it, done it ex ex exactly what Miller Valentine did. Just, just so you know, it's a very, very large, experienced company. We are. Uh, with that company right now, we're doing three projects in, 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 in Iowa. Uh, two of them are historic re rehabs. One is the Re Register and Tri Tribune building in uh, Des Moines. It's a $27 million development, um, historic. And also the Commonwealth Apartments in C Cedar Rapids, which is a $12 million historic property. But the process that P P Peter talked about is exactly the same. We, we we would go for a uh, we would go for exactly the same type of tax credits. We'd go to the Iowa Finance Authority. <clears throat> um, the difference between our projects are we, we did not anticipate any any type of offsite housing, and I think that's what you're talking about, right? Offsite or onsite? Oh. Oh, onsite and offsite, right? So we th there there there's a large piece of land there. Uh, obviously, it's included in the site that we, we would want to fully develop. But the num number of units that we, we talked about, I think our, our architects estimated that at probably in the existing building, 50. Um, a possibility of working with the, with SHPO, which is the State Historic Pre Preservation Office, of maybe increasing that uh, slightly. Um, we have a very good relationship with, with those folks. We, like I said, we have two, two projects under, under construction now with the State Historic Pre Preservation Office. Um, and they are a challenging group to, to deal with, just so you know. And P P Peter kind of mentioned that it's, it, it, is a, it is a challenge getting these federal tax credits, uh, but it's something we feel pretty good about, actually. Um, but other than that, the, the process is exactly the same, and I'm sorry I didn't bring you all the information on TWG. Um, I could pro provide that, uh, obviously, the next, next time we meet. But the development is very, very similar. It has, has to be geared to be able to get financing incentives from, from the Iowa Finance Authority. Uh, so the structure has to be pretty, pretty much the same as Peter outlined. Um, there's, there's virtually no, no difference in the process. If you want to receive an award, you have to do it a certain way. Right. Uh, so that's, that's the way it's got to be done. So that's all I have, actually. So, if there's any questions, I'm glad you got that. <laughs> and, uh, there you go. We'll see how things uh, progress. But I'm, Great. again, Good. I'm I'm just excited that uh, I was excited the first time you came to Burlington. I'm glad you came back, and uh, and the same with you. Um, Great. Uh, hope we hopefully we can get something something Good. worked out Good. on that. It's a it's a terrific building, and certainly we we would like to have it have it preserved as you would. Um, it's, and I think it's, I mean, the bones of the building are great. I, I've, I've been th through it tw twice now, actually, and I, I think it's, it's a spe spectacular. Job. I walked with, with, the, with the mayor through it. We had, he told me stories about the buildings. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, that was great. But that, that's all I have, if there's any questions. Can I, can I just ask a question sure. about the solar school sure. the project? Do you have any other take on it, um, um, why it may not have gotten funding? or No. No. Not at this point. I think we will. Have you talked with the property owner on yes, I advised have. him? Okay. Not not a happy person. <laughs> uh, I'm not happy and you're not happy, uh, but that's that's the way these programs work sometimes. So. Okay. Thank you. Right. Thank you. Thank you, Richard. We appreciate it. Okay. Uh, next we have a uh, Flood Mitigation Phase 5 Steering Committee. And gentlemen, have safe travels. Thanks. 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 So we're in the phase now where we can start doing design for the first phase of our flood mitigation project. Uh, showing up there, it's actually called Phase 5, just the way this thing is structured, but for our intents and purposes, it's the first phase we're doing with increment money. It's uh, the flood wall from the port to the auditorium along 
the park as well, uh, as well as flood, proof flood proofing the lift station and then doing a green alley. We also have some money set aside for parking lot improvements. As, so as part of putting the flood wall in the parking lot, they have to tear it up and then rebuild it. So we've set aside about 850000 for restoring that parking lot. There's the opportunity to do other things in that area. So our consultants would like to get started on choosing the design of the flood wall, choosing what the green alleys will look like, and also choosing whether or not anything is done with that parking lot in between the port and auditorium. They'd like to come down the first week in April and have a series of meetings with all concerned stakeholder groups and then a steering committee that would guide the development of their, their recommendations and their designs. And as part of that, I would like a city council member to be on the steering committee to represent the city council. The meetings would be April 5th, that's a Tuesday at 7.15 p.m., Wednesday at 5 p.m., and then Thursday, April 7th at noon with an open house meeting that night. Um, I'd like to have the makeup of this steering committee all set by the April 4th uh, council meeting where you could officially designate the steering committee members. Um, other people on the steering committee are Jim, myself, Ryan Gorley, our park superintendent, Jason Hutchinson with Greater Burlington Partnership. We have a Steamboat Days representative, a representative from the Planning Commission, then the Riverfront Advisory Board, Downtown Partners, and our city engineer. And then we're also engaging stakeholder groups. Steamboat Days is their own stakeholder groups. BNSF is a stakeholder groups. The Short Line Rail is. Uh, just city staff is a stakeholder group. The Riverfront Advisory Committee will be a group. The downtown businesses will be a group. And then uh, various events like the fishing tournament will be a stakeholder group. Okay. Is there anybody from the council that uh, has a desire to be on the flood, uh, on the steering committee? Is there anybody that really wanted to be on the? I would if nobody else does. Is that, is that something you wanted? Yeah. Chick Chang, we have a winner. It's, it's a busy week. Mm. Pardon me? You don't get paid extra, do you? Well, I don't care. Is that going to change, that gonna change your... Island, right? <laughs> yeah, just, each, we, each one of the council members give me a dollar. Gosh darn it. If somebody's <laughs> getting a dollar, it's going to be Bob. We may provide cookies and water at the meetings, so... Pardon me? We may provide cookies and water at the meetings. <laughs> ah, you may. There you go. <laughs> Maybe. Or uh, nuts and raisins. <laughs> you can never go wrong with that. Okay. Good deal. Good deal. We're getting excited about that. About a whip in a chair. To come what? together. So. About a whip in a chair. <laughs> <laughs> you have to bring your own. <laughs> yeah, you'll be making the will. call on that come in April. Yeah. Are there any other questions on that? No. You guys good? Okay. Thank awesome. You. Thank you, Charlie. Moving Charlie, ahead. thank you for all your work on this. Sure. No doubt. I really, really appreciate it. No doubt. Thank Exciting you. project. Yeah. Okay. Uh, next, we have the removal of private inflow sources from sanitary or from private inflow of product from sanitary, however you want to look at it. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Ryan. Thank you. Thanks. Does make it down? Mayor and City Council, uh, Ryan and I are going to kind of tag team this one. I'm going to sit here. He's going to be there. I'm going to start with, uh, this is a drawing that I used in my, when we talked about it during the budget session, but I think it has a lot of applicability here. Uh, Burlington has started with a, with a combination sewer system, and you can see we've got the, the, the combination sewer here, and in that sewer came all the waste from the household into it, also, the storm drains, et cetera, in it. Therefore, it's got combined storm and sanitary sewer. What we're going to concentrate on a little bit today is, you know, what goes on in the house that really the only thing that should be coming in should be the household plumbing is what, what would be the desired. Yeah. When we went through the separation process, because uh, all the sanitaries were connected at the lower level, typically we ended up putting in a new storm sewer and left the old combination sewer as a sanitary sewer. Now that has created some extra sources of uh, inflow in some areas that we are making repairs. If there are cracks or problems uh, with that, a lot of this old pipe 
Well, some of it we've seen old brick sewers that, that we've put back into place that were, I think, back in 1884. I know the one in Main Street's that way. A lot of the others are old clay tile, et cetera. So there are some problems there, but a lot of the water that we see coming uh, in is coming from these sources that come right from the household. Again, we expect the household plumbing waste to come in. That's going in there. Uh, what we don't really want is the roof drains, the sump pumps, and the foundation drains. Now, when we've gone through the planning process, and you maybe have seen this when they did the mazel, they would end up smoke testing a lot of these sewers, and that smoke would come back here, and it would rise out and come out the roof drains. Sometimes there are some area drains in here as well that would show up. So that's uh, the crux of what we're really talking about tonight, what Ryan's going to concentrate on, because we do need to go through a process of eliminating those drains. And then toward the end, I would like to talk more about the sump some kind of future plan to eliminate the sump pumps and the foundation drains. And I, I think this is the time to have that discussion. So again, here's what we're talking about, those inflow sources of, of concern, the downspouts, the area drains. Those are what Ryan's going to concentrate, and then I'm going to follow up a little bit with uh, sump pumps and the foundation drains. Uh, well, the da I'll just one more. Downspouts and area drains, those are usually easily identifiable through smoke testing. Sump pumps, those can be identifiable because they're right there in the building and you can kind of see where they're being directed. Are they going back out through the lateral to the, that or is it going outside? Foundation drains, those uh, trying to eliminate, they're going to be oftentimes difficult to identify and separate. You know, many of these were put in when the houses were there, and it wasn't a problem back in the old days. It was a combination sewer. You're directing it all just like we did the water off the streets. So as we go through that and we talk about it again, the concentration of which we're going to be working on is this area here, of which Ryan's got some letters and some procedures to go through with you folks. And then toward the end, maybe try to get some direction on, on, on these areas right here. Okay, I'll take over. Okay, downspouts and area drains. As Steve said, they're easily identified through smoke testing. Uh, that smoke testing was completed under um, the previous sewer studies in Cascade, uh, Hawkeye, MASL. Um, what we're looking, what I'm hoping to avoid is what happened with Hawkeye. Um, the city issued notices to residents to remove uh, downspouts from downspouts and area drains from the sanitary sewers, or what. Uh, combined sewers are going to be converted to sanitary. Uh, that took approximately seven years for compliance. Um, try not to use city resources that long pursuing this. Uh, so far with Cascade, we've sent out two notices um, and have had approximately 45% compliance at this point. Uh, and then the removal will be required in the MASL area. Uh, Within city code, there are a number of sections that prohibit, well, two sections in particular, uh, that prohibit inflow and inflow of surface run runoff and groundwater. Uh, your surface runoff is going to be your downspouts, area drains, and then your groundwater is obviously uh, sump pumps and foundation drains. Um, re relevant code sections include 95.06, prohibited acts under, I believe that's in the sanitary sewer section, uh, surface the relevant line here is surface runoff or groundwater uh, prohibited acts are to connect a roof downspout, sump pump, exterior foundation drain, area way drain, or other source of surface runoff or groundwater to a building, sewer, or building drain which is in turn connected directly or indirectly to a public sanitary sewer. Um, this is also addressed in chapter uh, 96.07. Um, it's the discharging of stormwater drainage. Um, the section also prohibits stormwater from being put into uh, our sanitary sewers. Uh, if you continue on in that chapter, uh, 96.11, uh, the abatement of violations, um, where these are found to be is considered a nuisance by city code and it can be abated as such. And that is the way I would like to address this to not drag this out um, for seven years. Treating it um, as a nuisance, uh, we'd issue a letter to the property owner, uh, either certified or hand delivered, uh, to the property owner, notifying them of the violation and giving them an 
a reasonable amount of time to be able to address the issue. Um, once that time has expired, if it hasn't been addressed, we would put together a project and bid it out to probably a number of different plumbers um, to come in and uh, take care of the project, uh, remove the inflow sources, and then uh, an assessment would be made against the property. I thought on situations like this that there was an opportunity, um, I just want to make this clear, or get this clear, that there was an opportunity that if somebody, okay, say we're going to do this and you have to comply by April, and they can't comply by April, that they had one opportunity to get an extension that they could call and say, well, hey, I had a situation or whatever, uh, and uh, I'm going to need uh, an extra month or something like that. Uh, I, I definitely think when you're dealing with this, you're going to run into a few people. I mean, I'm sure some people didn't comply because they just, some people don't like to be told what to do, whatever, you know, whatever. But some people, they just uh, were trying to figure out how they're going to make that happen and, and pay and buy groceries and that sort of thing at the same time. So. There are considerations that way as well. Um, I mean, you've got, you're right. There's a certain amount of people that are just going to say, no, I'm not going to do it because I was told I needed to do it. Um, and then there's people that obviously can't afford to do it. Uh, downspouts are one of the easier and cheapest things to address. Um, Eric, as far as additional extensions go, I mean, as far as in reference to Cascade, we've issued two letters over the course of about a year and a half. Um, so there's been time as far as Cascade goes. We would go issue another letter giving them probably 30 days uh, to address the issue. Eric. There's nothing that says you have to give an extension. That's up to, I guess, policy department staff. And we try and work with people on nuisances, but when you're dealing with something like this, and like our ash trees, we set a firm date on that ash tree. And because we had to send out bids and we couldn't be dealing with 20 different people on 10 different extension time frames. So it just depends on the project and how much you're able to work with them on the ash trees. We're able to set up payment plans. So that's something a little different, but. I mean, that, that's something just, well, just internally, thought. once you send the letter on that date, you can abate it. It's, it's how, how lenient you want to be, and that's up to departments or staff or council on, on that. Well, and this is part of the reason why I'm here. If that's something, I mean, we want to get this taken care of, sure. not taking that seven years. Uh, <laughs> yeah. But the primary purpose that we're here is to notify you of what we would like to do and then that we would like to address this in accordance with city code. But if there are concerns that the council has, we're definitely here to entertain those concerns. If you I, I just, again, I, I, I hear what you're saying. I agree with you. I just think um, uh, that there are going to be those few cases that, yeah, it's like, no, it's not an expensive fix. But you tell that to somebody that after they pay all their bills and buy their limited amount of groceries that they've got $12 to last them for yep. the rest of the week. Because I no person such as that and it's literally down to the dollar that they that they have so um, uh, I just wanted to see how that how that process works especially when it's not uh, with the ash trees I just don't think it's the same thing ash trees if you don't get that taken care of they're gonna fall on they're gonna fall down and hurt somebody and tear stuff up um, you know on, on this sort of deal it just comes down to the nice thing about the way we've gone about this um, is generally our combined sewers are converted to a storm sewer. Um, if they were converted into a sanitary sewer, that pipe, sorry, our combined sewers are converted into um, sanitary sewers. Yeah, so they're oversized sanitary sewers. If we were to come through and install a new uh, sanitary sewer instead of a new combined sewer, that pipe would be much smaller. So then downspouts connected uh, and all your other um, infiltration sources would be uh, sign have a significantly greater impact on downstream neighbors. Uh, you'd be flooding basements with sump pumps, things like that. Uh, so by converting the combined into sanitary, we've avoided some of that, but we still have the issue of things like combined sewer overflows and sanitary sewer overflows, things like that that occur because these are still connected. Um, I don't have an issue with giving a couple of notices for or working with people that are in a difficult situation. Like I said, I just am trying to avoid this dragging out for um, 
seven years. Enough said. You got. Uh, you, you don't have to answer any more for me. You guys have been compassionate. I just want to make <laughs> sure that that's, that was thrown out there, that there is going to be a couple of those cases. But uh, well, and I, I know that we all try to handle them. I know with what my experience is that you guys always try to uh, uh, try to be <coughs> merciful uh, as well as getting it done. So. Well, and going through the assessment process could provide them a little bit of buffer there. Eric, how have your abatements worked in the past? Is that just a lump sum next tax season? Okay. Uh, I know that when I was uh, working at a consultant firm in college, uh, the city of Fairfield did a sidewalk program where property owners were given, I think they were given 90 days uh, to bring all their sidewalk into compliance that went ward by ward. Um, and there they were, that assessment was drawn out over five years. Um, big thing there is that should be a more costly situation than what we're talking here, um, at least with downspouts. Area drains can be more costly to address. Um, so what our intended procedure would be, would be to notify property owners of where our sewer separation progress is and that we're under consent order with the DNR and that um, the connection of their downspouts or area drains to the sanitary sewer is a violation of city code. Um, we would provide them a reasonable 30 to 45 day um, time period for corrective action and that they would notify us once the work has been completed. Um, our 45% compliance rate in Cascade, uh, there may be more that have complied and just haven't told us. Um, and then if that doesn't occur, um, failure to take corrective action would result in us like I said, putting together a project, taking care of the problem, and then assessing um, by abating the, the nuisance. Um, sump pumps and foundation drains. Steve, I'll let you take over again. They're, they are currently, as Ryan indicated, they're currently prohibited from being connected to the sanitary sewer. They're definitely not allowed in, in new construction. Uh, because they're prohibited doesn't mean they've been disconnected. And as Ryan indicated, they are a contributing cause of the SSOs, the sanitary sewer overflows within the separated system. Um, some ways to kind of look at the foundation potential op options is to basically, uh, at the time of transfer, basically when a property sells, remove both sump pumps and footing drains. Uh, again, I think there's gonna be difficulty with footing drains, but uh, with sump pumps, definitely that's something that's extremely doable and I'll have a little bit of illustrations that doesn't mean they won't come uh, with issues and in some cases we could develop a partnership between the city and the residents to provide funding for the removal of of sump pump and footing drains again that's more of a political decision on your part and maybe there are other options that we haven't even brought up here in, in this presentation just a second Steve uh, huh? one correlation to the removal of sump pumps um, from the sanitary sewer at time of transfer would be uh, what the state requires in rural areas with septic systems. Um, at the time there's property transfer, the septic system's inspected, and if it's not compliant with current standards, uh, the seller is required to bring um, the septic system up to current standards. So this, pro well, proposed proposal um, <laughs> would be kind of mirroring that process um, as far as the time of transfer goes. Uh, as part of this process, we, we didn't allow a whole lot of time, but as in a lot of these cases, I did reach. Just, yeah. I was just going to comment oh. that, that removing the downspouts from the from the uh, system is not a big expense. I've done uh, some of that, and it's it's really very inexpensive. Uh, it's not a it's not a major project. What ends up then? So it, it's above ground then, and it's just yeah, it just goes out on the ground. Goes out on the ground. Yeah, yeah. Uh, you plug off the you plug off the existing uh, right. tile yeah, or whatever. Yeah. Yeah. Just, we snap it off and, and plug it off. It's it's not a big issue. The sump pumps, again, is not a big issue. You just you just have to redirect it and direct it outside the house <coughs> and not into the sewer system. That's not a big expense. Now, when you get into talking about the the removing the uh, footing tile and footing drains from the sanitary system, then you're talking a big expense. Um, you're, you're, uh, in some cases, you may be talking four or five, six thousand dollars. Oh, gee. Um, the uh, st a lot of the a lot of the footing tile 
it's placed on the outside of the house at the, at the footing tile, as it says, and it goes around and it ties in to the sanitary sewer on the outside of the house. And that's why it's hard to detect. I mean, it's actually part of the, the sewer system. And the, and the downspouts are generally tied to that as well. Uh, so you would have to excavate on the outside of the house and after you find the point of where those come together and disconnect that and then you would have to bring it into the house or create a lift station on the outside of the house to wow. for somewhere for that water to go and then you'd have to pump it out you'd have to you yeah. know, so so you're talking uh, a rather expensive proposition that's where I like what Steve was saying about the possibility of of assessments or the possibility, like Ray had mentioned, of uh, coming up with some kind of fund to assist in that, because it's um, it's it's going to be people of our age that are that may be looking to downsize and go into uh, a um, uh, a condo situation or apartment or something like that, and we're going to take our house that we've purchased and paid for and sell it and we're gonna have to put an extra five or six thousand dollars into it to, to get it to, sell. to do that that separation and that I, I'm, I'm concerned about that because it's that's what's happened in the in the rural areas where where uh, where dad's died mom's left at the house and she's got to sell the house but she's got to spend twelve thousand dollars upgrading the the uh, septic yeah. system we're, we're looking at the same kind of thing we're taking a lot of money out of out of uh, individuals pockets now there's other there's other footing tile that are inside the house that 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 uh, go into a, a sump pit and then ra uh, rises up and goes into a sanitary sewer and those could be fixed relatively inexpensive by eight eight hundred thousand dollars just by creating a sump pit and, and uh, redirecting that to that sump pit rather than into the into the floor drain so it's you know there's that's relatively expensive, but there's, with all these old houses that we have in, in this community, um, that the, the potential to have a lot of those is, of uh, those ones I talked about first is, is highly probable. And I'm not, I, I'm, I think it's, it would make a tremendous difference in our, in our uh, sanitary overflows, make a huge difference in the sanitary overflows something that needs to be addressed as far as I'm concerned but um, keep that in mind as we as we discuss this the the cost sorry Steve. I'm sorry I should have put that tag team by me uh, Ryan Steve and you Tim and I couldn't have put it any better myself but uh, Councilman Scott brings up a very good point and that's one thing that we did uh, hint at and that's that I mean it is very costly to try and address footing drains on your older homes. Um, some of the, my understanding is from like the 50s to maybe even late 70s, had a lot of um, footing drains that did drain to a sump pump. So removing that sump pump also removes the footing drain. Um, but there are a lot of those old houses that that won't be the case. And that being the situation, I think probably the most prudent first step would be um, the idea of removing sump pumps at time of transfer and then potentially having the council uh, pursue footing drains at put potentially a later date. When you're, when you're talking removing sump pumps, you're just talking about removing them from the sanitary. Removing not, them from the sanitary, Not removing yes. them from the basement. Yeah. Correct. Okay. Pumping outside. Be it uh, pump overland. outside or directly <laughs> into a storm. Pumping building. overland versus underground into right. the sanitary. Right. Right back Do we have a standard that pro would not allow sump pumps to dump into the street? Uh, believe city code does prohibit pump some pumps uh, directly connecting to the street uh, if it doesn't my office doesn't allow it they'd need a right-of-way permit to do it um, but I believe city code says they're supposed to be discharged on property I've seen that happen one time <clears throat> more than once I only seen it once but yeah I've, I've seen it where they're pumping uh, it just creates icing yeah. situations in the winter well I'll just continue as I did reach out to other public works directors and a lot of the things you just mentioned uh, really came up I only heard back from two uh, Greg from Council Bluffs and again I'm there's I basically took the majority of all their comments and put them in here for your reference but I'll highlight a few things again in Council Bluffs they've 
been working on this for over 25 years. Uh, one thing different here that when it came to the downspouts, the city did offer up $75 to the homeowners to separate them. Uh, that's a practice we haven't done, and I'm not necessarily encouraging that because we didn't do it when we did the Hawkeye and the initial phases of the Cascade. Um, another thing that came out, sometimes when the houses were so close together, now they started discharging instead of underground overland, and houses were close together. Now they caused another problem because the water went overland, and maybe the way the drainage went now goes into the neighbor's basement or caused other issues. Uh, when it has gone directly into the street, like you indicated, Jim, they've indicated uh, that sometimes these areas won't be allowed to dry out if you're in a real wet high groundwater area, especially those houses on the uh, probably the south side where they don't get a lot of sunshine. Even that little curb will end up with a moss kind of growing on it. I mean, I think you've, we've got some uh, uh, along Main Street, we've got some springs and stuff come out, and you'll see that that kind of mossy growth growing right there. Something similar if you had a a constant downspout coming out. And uh, then the other one, when you go out in the gutter, sometimes in the winter it'll freeze over and will cause problems. I actually had a house in Davenport that did that. And it sometimes it, it did make my curb to get over into my uh, driveway easier when it froze over. <laughs> but, uh, but nonetheless, it would be prohibited. Uh, kind of got similar comments from, uh, from uh, uh, Joe from Mason City. Again, uh, they did the smoke testing, and again, just like us, their ordinance prohibits, but it's not strictly enforced. They started five to ten years ago. Uh, they did it with the city inspector. A city employee did the inspections. Uh, noted one of the problems they found it uh, properties now discharging into the streets, again, going back to the winter months and the ice buildup. And uh, overall, they, they had a similar position like our operations manager put him involved I'm not professing that we do that, but uh, he, through his due diligence, they had, had good efforts. So it's not to say that just because we do this, it won't create another series of problems. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't move him up. Uh, let's get the right one. So our concluding thoughts. I think roof drains, uh, Ryan's provided direction outlined in the presentation. That's got a check mark. I think that's that needs to be done and it's relatively inexpensive. Sump pumps, uh, we'd recommend start elimination at, at least at the time of transfer and we probably set some kind of a date and then maybe a future date where you would eliminate, have them eliminated altogether. Again, we put a check mark there. That, both of those two can be relatively inexpensive. Now, when the foundation drains or the footing drains, uh, we'd love to do that as well. At the, at, and we've kind of put that if feasibly identifiable and correctable at the time of transfer, when again with another future date out there. But this one has a question mark. Uh, you know, I, I couldn't, have, none of us could have put it any better, Tim, than the way you did it. Uh, it. It could be expensive, but it's a real problem out there. And I do think Jim has indicated this in the past that it kind of helps if we can be a little bit proactive uh, when the DNR, these sanitary sewer overflows. We, we're continuing to have them. The state, to my knowledge, has documented. They came down, they look at them. They haven't said anything to date. But at some point in time, if we're taking proactive steps like this to eliminate it, it will bode better for us, I think, in the long run because we're proactively trying to take actions that will minimize these, these ongoing sanitary sewer overflows. Well, and the primary reason why the state probably hasn't come down with uh, a declaration that we need to address that is the fact that we are still addressing our combined sewers. Yeah. Right. Um, once the combined sewer situation is resolved, don't be surprised if the state comes back saying we need to address the sanitary sewer. I expect now. the state to just keep so, bouncing from one thing to the next, so I, I never expect that. That's exactly stuff. what you're going to see <clears throat> until everything's just perfect in their mind. And then uh, Overall, I guess as, as we are with a lot of things, we're looking for some direction from the council. How would you like staff to proceed in these three areas, roof area drains, uh, sump pumps, and the foundation drains? So, I, I think you guys made a great presentation. Uh, uh, the city manager helped me out on that. Um, uh, as far as the, uh, the time allowed, can we, uh, how did you say was the best way to set that up? Is, um, well, if you're wanting to do have some ability for flexibility on time. Why don't you just make it a 90-day 
compliance standard, so you give a little bit longer period of time for folks to comply with that. If we just set, just set it up. Now you're talking the roof drains? The roof drains. If that Ironically, the first um, time frame that we did give them was 90 days um, in Cascade, and I have no issue with a 90-day time frame. It just, depending it, on what time of year that notice goes out, that creates interesting timing just, for us to get it And again, I'm area. just throwing out there, you're the one that's been dealing with it, Ryan, and you know the history. You're of the, the ones who will get the phone calls. Yep. <laughs> I have, that's right. that's I right. have no issue with the 90-day uh, time frame. City code might actually, um, Chapter 95, the end of it, uh, I didn't put that up there, did give a 30-day time frame, um, but then 96 gives a whatever's reasonable or whatever with abatements so I don't have an issue with Let's go 90. a 90 day that's right. why we're here is to find out what you guys exactly how you'd like it so if 90 days what you want to see we'll go with 90 if days to me if it's 90 or if it's 30 I, I just rather get that wrapped up <clears throat> so it's a done deal and we don't have to keep you know at least that way that's that's kind of set in stone and, and we've got a we've got a place to go I did like the 90 days though myself but. Now with Cascade, um, having since they've already had two notices, does council have an issue with a 30-day notice before uh, we abate? I think. And then going forward in MASL, we do the 90, or would you like to see us do 90 on both? From from my standpoint, I think the council ought to say, staff, you have uh, one year to get all of the roof drains disconnected in the city and use your uh, best judgment for getting that done, but I, I think it's absolutely necessary that, that we direct the staff to enforce the ordinance and, and get it done. Um, I, we, uh, we can say be you know, as gentle as you can be, but get it done. So you give them 90 days notice right now and they don't get it done, you go back to them and say, we've got till uh, March 15th of uh, 2017 to get this done. And, uh, and and get it done. Just make, just plan on getting it done. I mean, that's that's. I think that's what our direction ought to be. And uh, and I think the uh, the same thing with uh, with some pumps. I don't think we need to wait until the time of transfer. We're not talking a huge expense. We're not talking a lot of work. Uh, we're talking in some cases what somebody that's handy at, uh, can do themselves. It's, it's not rocket science that, uh, to hook a sump pump up and, and run it outside, especially if the pump's already there. It is for me. <laughs> there, I know there's I people feel like, like that's you. Probably a lie. That <laughs> need, speak need, for yourself. That need help with, with uh, toenail clippers. But hey, you and I could come over and help him, couldn't we? Pardon me. You and I could come over and help him. Yeah. Tim do it for free for for Bob services. I mean, it's just <laughs> like because the. The that impact that it's going to have on the sewer system, I think, is going to be huge. And if we, if you know, if if we're not doing that, then the DNR is going to keep on our our tail until we do it. That's that's the easy. Those are the easy things to do, and can make a tremendous impact. And for my profession, I can tell you that there's not very many basements in this community that doesn't have a violation from either sump pumps or from from uh, footing tile drains. Um, they're, I, I mean, they're, if it's, if it's older homes. Mayor Pro Tem. So then you, we'd have set up a program where somebody's gonna go actually into their house and, and inspect. I don't think that's necessary. I think educating the people on the, on the sump pumps and the roof drains shouldn't, uh, shouldn't be an issue more than going there and knocking on the door once. If people haven't notified them that, they're, that they've become compliant. Uh, because we've been doing the notification just through sending them a letter, right? For um, roof drains and area drains where smoke testing's occurred. Right. Um, as far as who's hooked in with a sump pump into the sanitary sewer, uh, none of the sewer studies have addressed that. There has been no house to house to determine that yes, this one goes into the sanitary, this one just dumps outside. I think um, it's and that's, just, sorry. I think I think the sump pumps is just a matter of educating people. Just saying, this is this is why this is what what has to be. This is why it has to be, and this is what happens if it isn't. And uh, um, most 
most people are going to comply. Man, I would love to agree with you on that. I, I don't know. Yeah. With the most people are going to comply part. Not, not all of them are going to comply because I talked to a guy Sunday when I was working on his basement. I said, I, I explained to him that he had his storm drains were coming into his sanitary sewer and it's inside the house. I said, you might want to start planning now to get that separated because it's going to become mandatory. You're going to have to do it probably at the time of transfer someday because that's the way the state's leaning. And I said, that's the way the city's leaning. And uh, he said, Shh, don't, don't ask, don't tell. And I said, hey, I'm not, I'm not going to rat you out. I'd be, I'd be out of business. But I'm telling you, you're contributing to a huge problem that we have in the community, and you need to start planning on it. Councilman you Scott, start planning what there. was that address again? <laughs> What's your address? <laughs> <laughs> Thanks a lot, man. <laughs> Should I give him your it address? Wasn't me. No. It wasn't me. Um, I, um, you just had a Sergeant Schultz moment. I, I know nothing. <laughs> I, 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 just, I just really think it need, would, by, if, well, we have to do it. I, kicking it under the yeah, table, I'm going to get it again, done. I, what are we going to do, Go. Sorry. One of the things one of the things that you can do to hit what he's trying to get at and what they're kind of recommending, have you looked and seen what other communities that have done a, an ordinance change where they've required that inspection on the pump, sump pump? We haven't gotten quite that far. Like I said, I reached out, you know, over the last couple of weeks and only got two responses from ten. But it, I, it's something we need to do more. I'm just this is I, just the tip of the iceberg. I think there are some communities out there that have done a time of sale. A requirement that they've written into their ordinances to, for getting the sump pumps off and sense. having that done will at least give you that as a fail safe for those that you can't get to get it done by other means. Yeah, I wish there was a way that we could work with the uh, assessor's office and as they go in to do reassessments if we could if we could piggyback <laughs> I, I know I know no. I, no. Agree. I wish there was a way that we could piggyback off of uh, off of that. Should we send out a Information letter with the water bill or something along those lines. Is that how we kind of notify everybody in the city? Uh, as far as some pump goes, I think that'd be a wise choice. Um, I do agree with Councilman Scott that getting this done sooner rather than later. Uh, time of transfer works great over time, but you don't see that immediate impact. Um, right now, I'll be honest, I'm just trying to get roof drains out. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, I think we should focus on at least what exactly we want to do with each line item because I feel like we're I feel like we're bouncing around a lot but as far as to... as far as sump pumps go that informational letter say, stating that this is what occurs when your sump pump is in the system and it creates problems downstream you may see some compliance with that that people are willing to address that on their own and that letter could also include the comments that uh, the council is looking at options for addressing sump pumps that way it has just a little bit more authority behind it um, of this is coming down the line. You may see more compliance that way. But I feel like uh, just informational, you're going to see uh, at best 45% compliance because that's what we've seen. So, so t take me back, Ryan. From your perspective, what's the best way yes, to yeah. get compliance on this, to get full compliance as soon as possible on this set issue? Full compliance as soon as possible would be you'd have to do a house to house inspection to find out what's actually connected and what's not and issue the uh, owner a uh, notice that they are in violation um, and then treat it uh, as a nuisance. Um, that would be your fastest and dirtiest route. Uh, the easiest route is time of transfer, um, but that doesn't occur quickly. So but the fastest and the dirtiest route is also going to cost us uh, um, how much money? It's you know from well, you're. I mean, we're going to have to have somebody and I'm going house to house know. inspecting. Can um, you one one quick history? Yes, sir. When when uh, the development was done south on Summer Street, um, I think it was called Deer Run or something like that. Mm -hmm. uh, no, uh, that's not Parkway. Uh, between Parkway and Kessner, yeah, yeah. Sioux, Navajo, and, and that area, there was a there was a huge problem with with uh, sewer backup. And the one lady at the very end that lived on that lived on Summer Street was having the biggest problem. Her basement literally filled clear to the ceiling. 
she had after the second time this happened, she had to take all of her all of her um, her furnace, her water heater, and everything out of the basement. And they said, and they they said, why is this happening? It never happened before until this until this development occurred. There was also a school teacher that that uh, lived out there that was having I can't remember I can't remember his name, but he was having the same kind of problems. What the city ended up doing was. Uh, telling everybody they had to disconnect their sump pumps. And they got uh, partial compliance, not a lot, but then they sent the building inspectors out and had them check. Well, they, they uh, found out that there was a large number of them that were still connected. What, what the city ended up doing was put, it, put a, a, a storm drain tile down the backyards between these, between these streets and then had everybody hook up to them. And there was a cost associated to the to the property, <clears throat> but it got the job done. It done a, it done great for a period of time. I mean, she didn't have any more backup. They also put a backwater valve in at her house too. But uh, it it done real well for a long time. But then they started noticing the flow increasing more and more and more. There's a lift station out there, right, Don? That they go into. Um, the, the lift station couldn't keep up. Is what the problem was, but it was because of all this water coming in from from all these sump pumps. Um, they uh, that was the way that they resolved the issue, and for a long period of time, it took care of it. They've had some some problems, but nothing like like it was back in the uh, early two thousand, late nineties, early two thousands. Um, that I mean, that's that's one approach. It won't work in every neighborhood, but. Uh, they did do a house-to-house -house inspection because it, it just well, it just had to be. I mean, there was there were there were people that were being affected financially uh, because of that. And that's where I said that we're lucky that our combined sewers have turned into the sanitaries because they do have the capacity that we don't have the backups that we would if it was um, a brand new sanitary line. I don't think that staff is asking for that to be done at this point. Uh, but there are, I think, the two action steps that they are looking for. They are looking, f they're wanting to send out the letters on the downspouts um, so that you're just aware that this is going on over the course of this next year. Um, and I think that to do what Steve is looking at in regards to the sump pumps at time of transfer, if you go look at the city of Nevada, they have an ordinance in place for that. Um, I'm sure there are other towns that do too, but that's a pretty easy one to, to find uh, a community that has one in, already established that, that would meet the requirements, what you're looking for for a time of transfer, the process that would need to be done uh, to accomplish that. And there may, but you do need to be forewarned that as time goes on, and you're aware of it, Tim, this is going to be an issue that gets, we have more and more mandates from the DNR to, yep. to do a better job of t tightening our ship. and we very likely could be to a point where we have to do those door-to-door -door -door inspections to try to eliminate some of the issues that we have. Well, it's, it, it's a lot cheaper, I think, to do that than it is to build this huge million-gallon tanks to hold yeah. uh, stormwater back, or sanitary and stormwater back, to release it as a, at a controlled release uh, and, and all of that water because we're allowing infiltration <coughs> from from downspouts and, yeah. and uh, um, sump pumps and, and uh, uh, area drains and footing tile. Well, let's do as we said. Then. So we get then can we, we can move forward then on the uh, yeah. the letters are going to go out. All right. We're all we're all satisfied with the, definitely want that to happen, right? Or no? I, I think, Jim, if I'm understanding you right, more of a plan with the sump pumps and the foundation. Hmm? More of a plan, a little bit more of a plan than just an out and out for the sump pumps and the foundation drains, a, a, a plan to eliminate those, looking at other ordinances and changes. Uh, I just mentioned the sump pumps. I'm not looking at foundation drains at this point. Okay, just sump pipes. Gotcha. Okay. You're, I think that you're, the council is likely going to have to go that. that at some point I, and I think you need to be very aware of it uh, but you're putting a lot of cost and burden on the homeowner to do that and you just need to be
be aware of that and do it at a do it at a point where you know that it's because you've got other alternatives that are being forced on you that you have to deal with. That makes sense. I mean, we're under this as, a, as something that w will be looming out there. Uh, when you get the monthly report from the from Don, it has the number of it gives the annual the annual totals by month, and if you notice the uh, annual overflows that occur. There's still a fairly high number. Uh, DNR that's tracks that they they know how many overflows we have. At some point, they'll have mandates on us on that. That's that's what the staff here is trying to get at. Okay. Okay. We all ready to go home yet? What's that? Are we all ready to go home yet? I, I think we're about there. Yeah. Um, council, do you guys, are you guys satisfied? Yeah. Anything else to bring up? Okay. Thank you, Ryan. And uh, thank you, Steve. We appreciate it. Uh, uh, city Manager, do you got anything uh, to close us out with? No. Okay. Uh, Councilman Flynn? Mayor Pro Tem? No. Uh, Councilman Scott? No, sir. Councilman Wilson? Good. Okay. And we're going to close on out tonight again. Thank you guys for your time. Good night.